First, we pitch them Disney, AT&T, IBM, blue chip stocks exclusively. Companies these people know. Once we've suckered them in, we unload the dog shit, the pink sheets, the penny stocks, where we make the money. 50% commission, baby. Ooh. Now, the key to making money in a situation like this is to position yourself now before the settlement. Because by the time you read about it in the Wall Street Journal, it's already too late. Is there a more satirical look at wealthy America than Martin Scorsese's The Wolf of Wall Street? The director's masterpiece is to quote the lead character, a money-crazed little shit. Every character in the film cares about money. Jordan Belfort, Donny Azoff, Brad, and of course, Mark fucking Hanna. Let's fuck! Scorsese's film was released back in 2013, a full three years before Donald Trump's eventual presidency. Now, the filmmaker could not predict the rise of the Trump. Hell, I don't think anyone could. But the filmmaker warns mainstream audiences with this horrid and perplexing look at wealth. Now, when I saw this movie in high school, every dude bro I knew was going on and on about how fucking awesome Jordan Belfort is, or how fucking hot Margot Robbie is. Interestingly, when the movie was released, a lot of critics took this film literally. To quote Mark Kermode, this exhausting movie has been charged with reveling in rather than explicitly judging the obscene lifestyle it predicts. And I cannot disagree more. Scorsese obviously wanted audiences to take this film as satire. For instance, before the movie even begins, the audience is treated to a fake promotional advertisement for Belfort's eventual firm, Stratton Oakmont. Stability. Integrity. Pride. <laughs> This is a film about greed and ego. This is a satirical look at how the world perceives riches and glory. This is further thanks to the brilliant decision to have Belfort narrate his journey. In the movie's opening scene, we witness Belfort and his fucking warriors as they throw little people towards a bullseye. You could easily get offended at this image, and of course people were, but you can also look at it as a statement on how the world sees excess. In an opening monologue that Leonardo DiCaprio perfects, we watch as Belfort walks through his beautiful and flawless lifestyle, akin to something out of MTV Cribs. See that humongous estate down there? That's my house. We watch as Belfort's wife, the gorgeous Naomi, fluffs around on his bed. The character remarks, Yeah, she was the one with my cock in her mouth in the Ferrari. So put your dick back in your pants. Now, Belfer is talking to us, an audience in a post-American dream society. The days of wanting a house, a wife, and kids are over. Today, we want it all. We want everything. He demonstrates that people today are driven by ego. In an interview with the South Morning China Post, DiCaprio stated that Belfort is something that seems to be a part of American culture. Look at young people and what the American dream means to them. It's all about accumulating more and doing what is best for you, in spite of how it affects anyone else. The character talks of his wife in such a trophy-like manner that you would have to assume Scorsese and his writer Terence Winter intended this as a statement in itself, that the character is an egomaniac who won't stop until everything in his path is either destroyed or his. As Belfort continues his monologue, we watch him walk through his house, breaking the fourth wall and talking directly to camera. Adderall to stay focused. Xanax to take the edge off, pot to mellow me out, cocaine to wake me back up again, and morphine, well, because it's awesome. If you watch closely, you will notice that the two people who helped Belfort on his way to his beautiful car happen to be black. Scorsese was heavily criticised for the lack of black actors involved in this film, but since Trump's rise to power and his overall opinion on minorities, it is safe to assume Scorsese tapped into something a 2013 society had not even thought of. The portrayal of the main character, Belfer, has been a topic of discussion for years. Some see him as a criminal and others see him as legend. But what Scorsese does with Belfort is rather interesting. While he starts the film with the character as an incredible asshole, he goes back to where the character began in order to develop the audience's sympathy. We watch as Belfort becomes everything he dreamed of, but what he dreamed of was not what it seemed. When Belfort meets Matthew McConaughey's Mark Hanna, the audience is introduced to the toxic power of Wall Street. Belfort states, I'm 22 years old, 
Newly married and already a money-crazed little shit. So what do I do? I go to the one place on earth that befit my high-minded ambitions. Hannah is the embodiment of the douche. The character wears a shirt that has a white collar but is majority blue and it is a fucking startling thing to look at. As Hannah and Belfort sit at a table ready to dine, the character immediately snorts cocaine. Continuing the motif of a lack of minorities, the waiter is, you guessed it, black. The film wants to make it incredibly clear that this is all a joke. Hannah remarks, Absolutely. Fuck the client. Your only responsibility is to put meat on the table. Number one rule of Wall Street. Nobody, I don't care if you're Warren Buffett or if you're Jimmy Buffett, nobody knows if the stock is gonna go up, down, sideways, or in fucking circles. Least of all stockbrokers, mm -hmm. right? It's all a fugazi, you know what a fugazi is? Here, Hannah is, in a way, breaking down the film. The character is discussing the fakeness involved in Wall Street, the lack of flux, to be honest. Hannah inspires Belfort in ways far beyond the character's presence. For instance, the character's iconic chest beat is repeated by Belfort later on in the film. I previously mentioned the role of greed and how it can do horrendous things to anyone. Well, take Belfort's first wife, Teresa. The character is cheated on by Belfort and is incredibly embarrassed when she discovers what her husband has been literally doing behind her back. In one of the most brilliant decisions ever put to film, Scorsese has the two argue and scream outside of Trump Tower. What fascinates me about this entire sequence is how horrendous Belfort has become. Scorsese places the culmination of all those things outside of the former home of the now president. Like the dude bros who saw this film and came away with the idea that Belfort was quote unquote goals. You imagine Trump and his related degenerates saw this film in the same way. It's kind of funny when you witness Belfort's remarkable antics in the Stratton Oakmont offices. The character is portrayed as this larger than life persona, almost akin to a god. Scorsese has Belfort speak to his employees as if he is their king and his people slaves. In a brilliant scene, Belfort remarks, This right here is the land of opportunity, Stratton Oakmont is America. Before witnessing the cheers and whistles of what appears to be hundreds of employees, going back to the earlier statements, Scorsese makes you like Belfort by using his charisma. Hey fellas, look what I found in my pocket, look, a year's salary right here. You know what I call them? Fun coupons. See that? A fun coupon. Following Belfort's American simile, the character asks an employee to announce what he did for them. What'd I do, Kimmy? Go on, tell me. You wrote me a check for $25,000. The camera does not move from her expression. It stands still, watching her as she breaks down. And why does Scorsese do this? Well, the simple answer is he wants you to be tricked. Good satire does that to you. The filmmaker wants you to forget the awful things that Belfort has done because he has done some good things too. Earlier in the film, Belfort remarks, Even in this market, is that I never ask my clients to judge me on my winners. I ask them to judge me on my losers because I have so few. And that kind of summarizes the whole movie. In 2017, a time of ego-driven, power-hungry capitalists, it is important to watch a film like this. Because says he could not have predicted Trump's eventual rise to egomaniac power. But he did warn us of the blindness found in the mundane. The Wolf of Wall Street is a brilliant satire as it forces the audience to question their morals and the behavior and actions of those who are given power. So you listen to me and you listen well. Are you behind on your credit card bills? Good, pick up the phone and start dialing. Is your landlord ready to evict you? Good. Pick up the phone and start dialing. Does your girlfriend think you're a fucking worthless loser? Good. Pick up the phone and start dialing. I want you to deal with your problems by becoming rich. <laughs> <laughs>